if you don't have social proof, that can plummet your self-esteem. What is What do you mean by social proof? Right. So social proof tells a student or an adult that you, you are important in this world. You make a positive impact on the world around you. The, the idea of mattering, whether it's for students or for people at work or for people who are retired, mattering matters throughout life. Young, old, rich, poor, there is what researchers call an instinct to matter. So beyond food and shelter, it is the instinct to matter that researchers say drive all of human behavior for better or for worse. When we feel like we matter, we show up in the world in positive ways. We achieve in healthy ways. We want to give back to society. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to be a great colleague. We want to lift people up because we have this deep core of mattering. When we feel like we don't matter, when we are made to feel marginalized, we can either fall inward, get depressed, anxious, lean on substance abu- substances to, to feed our 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 loneliness, or we can act out. So a school shooter is, you know, among the most tragic examples. You don't think I matter? I'll show you I matter. This is a, this is a universal need that we all have. And we are living in a society where it is going unmet for too many people. And that to me is the driving force behind the loneliness we're feeling, the anxiety that we think we're not worthy, the depression when we, when we feel invisible, when no one cares about us or when we think no one cares about us. So it sounds like we all have this innate, important, critical need to feel as though we matter in the world at large or to other people that we have something to contribute, that that is the core issue that most of us are struggling with. And the symptoms that it's not being met are things like loneliness, despair, feeling angry, anxiety, all of those things rise to the surface when this core need isn't met. I want to, I really want to on like dig deeper and deeper into this because I think when you know our audience which is now in 194 countries, when people write in, I have no friends. I don't know what to do with my life. I believe this is an issue that this person has no social proof that they matter. And so can you give us examples of what, what is social proof that you matter? In a corporate event, a 30-year-old raised his hand and he said, sometimes I feel like I don't matter. Is there a mantra I could say to myself to help me put myself in that mattering mindset? And I said, no. I said, here's what you need to do. You need to go down to your cafeteria and you need to smile at the cafeteria lady who always smiles at you and asks mm-hmm. you how your day is going. And you need to say to her, these days have been a little rough for me, but knowing that you're going to be there greeting me with this delicious meal, making me smile, you brighten my day every day. I just want you to know that. Unlocking the mattering in other people feeds our own mattering. So instead of a mantra, better to go out and be kind and you know caring to the person at the drugstore who's ringing up, you know, who's probably being attacked day in and day out for not moving fast enough or not. And just thanking them, just thanking everyday people, thanking a friend who's been there for you. Just a quick text. It, it Mattering is felt, you know, in big moments, right? When we are celebrating a milestone birthday and somebody gives a toast to us and tells us why we matter to them. But it's also found in little everyday moments too. And those little moments of mattering or not mattering pile up. I just remember distinctly, I was at a, uh, an office party with my husband and a guy was talking to me, but on his phone and texting the entire conversation. And I thought to myself, wow, I really don't matter here. I really don't matter to this guy. He wasn't being rude to me. He was just showing me, yeah, you don't matter as much as this phone. So when we, when our kids come up to talk to us and we're scrolling or we're doing a work email, they, they can be getting those small signals of not mattering like I got at that at that office party you recommend when kids come home from school that there's one question that you ask that shows that you matter what is that question I lead with lunch 
What does that mean? So, I, so <laughs> I, what I used to do before researching this book is my kids would come home and I'd be, you know, thinking, how'd you do on the Spanish quiz? How'd it go on your report today? And what I realized in, in doing the research was that the signal I was sending my kids, one was that achievement mattered. Two, this is what I'd been thinking about all day while they mm. were at school. Um, and so instead now when they walk in the door, I lead with lunch. I ask them, what'd you have for lunch today? And I got that idea because my grandmother, in every conversation I would have with her, she's since passed away, it would always be, what did you have for lunch? It was, I care about you. I care about your nourishment. I care about things that have nothing to do with how you look, what grade you got, how your career is going. I just care about you and your basic needs. And what did you see change in the oh. dialogue with your kids when you started asking about lunch instead of the Spanish test? I Well, first of all, what I have realized and what the research shows is my kids don't need me to ask about their Spanish test. They already are getting the signals everywhere that achievement matters so much. So what I've realized is that my home needs to be a place for kids to recover, for my teens to recover from the pressure they're feeling from their peers, from their peers' parents, from teachers, from the college admissions process. My home needs to be a haven from that pressure. So I don't need to ask about their Spanish quiz because they're going to tell me. It's already on their minds. So is the same true when your partner comes home from work or your roommates come home from work? How do you signal that they matter to you? What's the question that you ask? I think, you know, what was the best part of your day? I, I think it. Mm. What, what mattering to me is, is that I value for who you are at your core. It is not contingent on your performance. It's not contingent on how you look that day. It's not contingent on how many dates you're going on. You matter no matter what. Unconditional mattering. And we need to be a source of unlocking it in other people. And if you want to build your own self-esteem, put your attention on other people and unlock it in them. Make eye contact. Smile. Point out what you appreciate that people are doing for you. Thank people. Compliment their nails. Like I, I, It's so easy to do. And not enough of us are doing it. And you do get back this reciprocal exchange of energy that makes you feel important because you just made somebody else smile or you just made somebody else light up when you said their name. There was a Gallup study that was done that I found to be shocking that something like 80% of people haven't been told by their boss that they're appreciated in the last year. Not a single acknowledgement that what you do here matters and I appreciate you for doing it. And that to me is stunning, except for the fact that the same research showed, if I recall correctly, that most people assume you know how I feel about you. And that's the huge mistake that we're all making, that we assume that our kids know that we love them, but we never say that, that we put our attention on other things like the Spanish test, which then cues to somebody, that's what she cares about. That's all that she cares about. She's really happy when the team wins. She's not so happy when we don't. And so I think what you're revealing is this real thin veil that separates us from one another that we don't realize we need to have to get super, super proactive about. One of the reasons that people research finds this, that, that we don't tell people how much they mean to us and how much we appreciate them is because we think they're going to be embarrassed by our feedback. Really? And yeah, that, that when there's a research on gratitude about why people don't express their gratitude because they underestimate how the other person will receive it. And sometimes they think they'll embarrass the other person. Uh, but the research does not bear that out. So just to clear up any misconceptions. You just said that 80 plus percent of parents believe that if your kid is doing poorly on a test or gets bad grades, it is a reflection on your parenting, but you've got this amazing reframe. What does a, a bad grade mean? Yes, I got this wonderful advice from uh, child psychologist Lisa Damore, and I have used it in my own home as well. So when a child brings home a bad grade, in, you know, instead of dismissing it or saying that's okay, help them widen their perspective. Here's what here's what a bad grade on it on a one off test tells you. It tells you that that's what you knew that specific day. It, does, it doesn't mean how much your teacher loves you. It doesn't mean how well you're going to do in the future. It doesn't define who you are as a student. 
it's one test on one particular day and we all have bad days. I love that. I love that. You have this incredible family motto that you, I would love for every family to adopt this, but can you share it with us? Um, So in our family, we have a mantra, which is to never worry alone. And that's true of us as parents and also of our kids. And what I, what I hope to instill in my kids with that mantra is the idea that we are worthy of support. We are worthy of being held and nurtured and, um, and supported when we are having setbacks. We are not our setbacks. Our worth is our worth. And when we worry with others, we feel validated. We hear our worth. We see it in the support that others give us. We get that social proof that we are valued no matter what. Hmm. Whatever you do, don't, don't worry alone. That's when we get into trouble. So reach out for support. We think as parents, our job is to raise self-reliant, independent adults. And that is an important thing to do. But there is a more profound lesson that our kids need to learn if we want to raise them to be healthy. And that is the skills of interdependence, how to rely on others and how to have others rely on them in healthy ways. And so that's where the don't worry alone comes from, is part of the skills that I'm trying to teach my kids of interdependence. Oh, wow. That's so important. You're right. And we do focus on kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and being self being self-reliant and taking responsibility that modeling healthy connection and interdependence, getting support when you need support, talking about your feelings, that we got to model that too. And if you're not, you're teaching somebody to suffer in silence the way that so many of us have for generations. One other thing that I love that you wrote about was uh, this idea that being good enough is way better than being perfect. Why is that? Yes. So I I talk about this in the book that um, when my oldest was born almost 18 years ago, I thought about going back to graduate school to get a PhD in psychology so that I could be the perfect parent with the latest research. And (laughs) I know, crazy, right? Yes. And what I found is that perfection as a parent does not serve me and it does not serve my kids. What serves us both better is this idea of being good enough. And the good enough mother is responsive to her kids' needs. She doesn't meet every need because she can't. Only, you know, no one can. But to be responsive, to acknowledge it, to validate the need, and to do the best that you can do. And that takes us off the hook as parents, not needing to be perfect. And it helps our kids, you know, regulate their emotions when they get a little bit disappointed and frustrated that they can't have the perfect parent in this situation. It reminds me of this thing that you wrote that the difference between getting a 91% on a test and a 99 is having a good life. <laughs> that is it. That, that is it. And, it, you know, as parents, I, I certainly fell into this trap myself. The idea that we had to put our needs behind our kids at every turn. And I certainly subscribe to that idea of needing to be the perfect mother. And then I realized that I was getting burnt out. And I would say the thing that really changed my mind about all of this is the research. The number one intervention for any child in distress is to make sure the primary caregiver, most often the mother or the father, that their well being, their mental health is intact because a child's resilience rests fundamentally on their caregiver's resilience. And caregiver's resilience rest fundamentally on the depth and support of their relationships. I want to make sure everybody heard that. You're saying that based on the research, if there is a child that is struggling, the most important intervention that works to help the struggling child is to give the caregiver of that child deeper levels of support. Yes. If you're somebody that's listening to us right now and you're like, Jenny Mel, that sounds great, but I don't have anybody or I don't even know where to start or who the hell am I going to ask because everyone that I know is also burnt out. You have a framework for this. So can you lay it out for everybody listening? 
Sure. So this is a, a study that was originally started by Sonia Luthar, one of the leading researchers in the world on resilience. And she did a series of studies, including people who were busy mothers and also had a busy professional life. And she wanted to find out if one hour a week for three months, one hour a week with a small group of four to five people in the same sort of kind of world, if they could be sources of support for each other. And what she found was no mother bowed out, even when the busyness you know, of their of their professional and, and home lives were calling for them. One hour of the week, they met, they talked about their struggles. And at the end of it, she measured their cortisol levels. Those had lowered. She me measured well-being, relationships with their kids and relationships with their parents. And what she found was that you only need one hour of deliberate support a week, one hour. And for those of you going, but I don't know where to get it. Uh, churches have free daycare and they have a lot of support groups. That would be a great place to start. Community centers, looking in your town's Facebook pages for events that are going on. You're not going to find it sitting on your couch complaining to yourself about it. You're going to have to put yourself out there. You also say it's critical that we tell our kids and our colleagues and our friends our failure stories. What does that mean? So... My daughter was in seventh grade and she considered herself a good writer. And her seventh grade teacher, you know, gave her her paperback and it had red marks all over the place. So she was so discouraged. And I said, Caroline, come to my computer. And I pulled up an early article I had written for the Washington Post science section. And it was edited by a really seasoned, wonderful editor. And it was a bloodbath. I mean, there were comments, there was, I don't understand this. Can you add more here? I need another interview. It, where is this study? Where? And my daughter was like, oh my God, I can't believe they let you write for them. And I've been writing for them for 10 years now. And uh -huh. I said, see, at first I was embarrassed. I told her to need all that work to see all those red marks. And then I thought about it a different way. I said, oh, this person is trying to invest in me. They are trying to make me a better writer. So I now, t I welcome feedback is what I said to my daughter. You know, I sometimes even say out loud to myself in my office, well, that's enough for the day. Like <laughs> just that, because I, I, I have a tendency to overwork. And so I have to put the brakes on myself. And I want to model that out loud to my kids. You have a nicer way of saying, I'm always like, well, I just fucked up again. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, mom, dollar in the swear jar. I'm like, I'm going to be paying for your college tuition with the amount I'm swearing around here because I screw up all the freaking time. Right now I'm sitting in a hotel room in Salt Lake City. I've got about an hour before I've got to cross the street and head over to the convention center and give a speech. But something happened this morning where I caught myself going down a rabbit hole. I started worrying about something. Then the worries became even bigger. And I realized I'm doing that thing. I'm doing that thing where I am causing myself a lot of pain because I am catastrophizing. So many of us struggle with this. You may struggle with this, where your mind is constantly defaulting to what's going to go wrong or you're always dwelling on problems that haven't happened yet. And so I thought, why don't I just jump on the mic while I have a little bit of time here and explain what just happened to me because I know you're going to relate to it. So here's the deal. So I wake up. And I roll out of bed and I start my normal morning routine and I pick up my phone. And one of the reasons why I picked up my phone is because our oldest child, our daughter Sawyer, who's 24 years old, is in the middle of a solo backpacking trip on the other side of the world. And this is something she's wanted to do for a long time. It's really well planned out. And of course, because I'm her mother, <laughs> because I worry, I am tracking her location. And we're all on WhatsApp, we're in a family group text. And right now she is in Australia and she had planned as part of her itinerary that she was going to go on a couple solo hikes. <clears throat> Cue the worry, okay? I got my 24 year old daughter backpack on her back in a country she's never been to. Obviously it's relatively safe, but that does not uh, prevent me from coming up with all kinds of fantasies in my mind about what could go wrong. And so I've been pretty good. I've been really good. You know, I, I have 
been able to just enjoy from afar and not become a stalker, but something happened that caused me to spiral this morning. She summited this mountain in Australia to see a sunrise two days ago, and I haven't heard from her. And I go to track her location, and I'm like, where is she? And it's sort of rainbow wheeling, so I can't quite see where she is. And I know she's okay because she posted something on social media. But I woke up this morning and I immediately looked at my WhatsApp. There was no message from her in the family group chat. There was no message from her directly to me. I then went to Instagram. I looked in the DMs. There was no DM from her. And I started to panic. And what did my mind think? I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. Why don't you just step in my shoes for a minute? What do you think Mel Robbins was thinking knowing that her daughter had summited a mountain alone. It's like a five-mile hike up. She started at 4 o'clock in the morning to see the sunrise. We saw the photos of the sunrise. Haven't heard from her since. What do you think my mind is thinking right now? It's been 48 hours. She's on the other side of the world. Oh, you know, I'm not thinking, oh, I bet she met some friends and she's out having fun. Or maybe her phone died. Or you know what, Mel? Maybe she's so busy that she doesn't have time to talk to you because the whole point of her trip is not to keep you posted of her whereabouts. It's for her to go out and have this incredible experience and to grow and to discover and to be brave and to explore. That's not what my mind thought. Nope. You know what my mind thought? She's dead. She fell off the mountain after taking the uh, sunrise photo. The woman is dead. Then I thought, no, 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 maybe she got kidnapped. Then I thought, oh, no, she was sexually assaulted on the side of the trail. And somebody, I, I, this is disgusting, I know, but do not tell me that you don't do the same thing. That your mind goes dark. I'm talking gruesome, scary horror movie, dark, like in a nanosecond. And here's the thing. I know that this is a terrible thing to do. I know that this causes me pain. And I bet you do it too. I know you do, in fact, because I've seen the DMs that you write to me, whether it's you are worried about your money and you're constantly worried about something bad happening with your money or getting fired or forgetting about something for your kids. And that's where your brain is constantly settling. And here's what we're going to do today, because we're all guilty of this. There is so much research around the fact that worry is so painful in your life. Worry is a habit. This is a really, really bad spiral to get into. It causes you a lot of pain. It causes you a lot of stress. It can certainly bring on anxiety. And if you already struggle with a little bit of anxiety, it can make it a lot worse. It doesn't help with your confidence. And one out of three people, according to research, struggle with constant worrying. And so what I wanna share with you today is a six word sentence that I use all the time in these moments when I catch my mind spiraling. And it really helps. And it really helps me because it stops that freight train of bad and negative and catastrophic thoughts. And here's the six words. You ready? This is what I say to myself. What if it all works out? So as I'm standing this morning in my underwear, I don't even have a bra on this morning, and I've already visualized my daughter uh, falling to her death off of a cliff in the middle of nowhere in Australia. <laughs> I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm starting to notice my anxiety rising. It's 6.15 in the morning here, and I have inflicted self-torture on myself before I've had a glass of water or a cup of coffee. This is completely unnecessary. And I catch myself. And this is what I want to teach you to do. Because you need to start catching yourself. I think you and I can agree that we can't control anything that's happening outside of us, right? But we can certainly control our reaction to it. And so I'm standing there in my underwear I'm visualizing my daughter's death or the fact that she's been kidnapped and abducted. And I notice the stress rise and I say to myself, Mel, what if it all works out? 
What if it all works out? I mean, you can't argue with that, right? What if it all works out? Because in this moment where you're worried about getting fired or you're worried about forgetting something for your kids or you're worried about what will happen if the people that you love the most are going to die before you can say goodbye. Or this one happens for me a lot. I'll be sitting on a plane and it's taking off and I suddenly spiral and think, if this plane crashes, I, 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 I'm not going to see my daughter's wedding. I'm not going to meet my grandkids. I'm not going to get to do all this stuff that I really want to do in my life. And in that moment where I'm in the negative, what if this, what if that, what if the other thing? And I feel the pain rising and I feel the stress rising and I feel the self-inflicted torture coming on. I simply drop in those six words. What if it all works out? And here's what happens. It stops the spiral. That's the first thing that happens. What if it all works out? You just hit the brakes on the locomotive of worry. The second thing that happens is because it's a question, what if it all works out? you actually pause for a second and consider it. And what you realize when you stop for a second and you pause and you consider, what if it all works out? Is you don't actually know what's going to happen, do you? You're just choosing to make yourself believe that something terrible has already happened. But the truth is, in this moment, you don't know. And so it is a fact a logical fact that it could all work out. And in fact, based on the research, this is kind of amazing. I want to, I want to throw some research at you. Um, let me find this. You can hear me flipping through my papers because there's a lot of really interesting stuff. There is a study at Penn State where they looked at chronic worrying. And the average person has three to four major worries a day. Okay. What if I get fired? What if I'm not happy? What if my marriage ends? Will I find love and have children? What if I don't make the money? What if this? What if that? What if the other thing? All these worries that every single one of us, you and me, we have at least three or four of them that cause us stress or make us feel some level of pain. According to this Penn State study, 91% of those worries are completely false. It's self-inflicted torture. And I think you and I both know that. And here's the other really kind of interesting thing. You know, the other 9% of the worries that do happen, the outcome is almost always way better than you expected, period. Okay. The outcome is way better than you expected about a third of the time. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that you going, what if it's a disaster? What if this happens? What if she's fallen off a cliff? What if I never hear from her again? What if she doesn't? Bah, 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 bah. What if it all works out? See, you don't know, do you? You don't know if you're getting fired. You don't know if you're going to run out of money. But you can rely on the research that 91% of the time it doesn't happen and a third of the 9% of the remaining, it's way better than you thought. And that leaves you with a 6% chance that something might happen. And here's how I look at this. If something bad happens, I will deal with it then. Why do I need to torture myself now? when I don't even know if something amazing is happening or something bad is happening. And so what if it all works out is a way for you to catch yourself because you and I inflict so much pain and it is pain. It's pain when you do this to yourself. It was painful to stand in the bathroom here in Salt Lake in my underwear brushing my teeth thinking about my daughter's death. And it's completely ridiculous. It's, it's not like, give me a break, Mel. Give me a freaking break. And I know all our fans right now in Australia and New Zealand are like, oh, she's fine. Like that, 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 that is ridiculous, Mel. It is, it is so fabulous. People do this all the time. They hike that trail. It's wide. It's this. It's that. I know the mountain you're talking about because she went up for the sunrise. You're completely ridiculous. That's why you need this six-word sentence. What if it all works out? Because it will interrupt the spiral. Welcome back. It's your friend Mel, and you and I are sitting here, and I was just confessing to you that I did a whole worry spiral this morning, and I'm teaching you one of my favorite tools, the six-sentence word, what if it all works out? We need to know that it is painful to stand there and be terrified that you're going to uh, not be able to say goodbye to somebody that you love because you're scared of flying, and now you're sitting in an airplane seat. And when you say to yourself... What if it all works out? You know what it's like? It's like, okay, life just fired an arrow at you. And I want you to stop and think right now, okay? 
What is an arrow that life fired at you? And think about something going on in your life right now. And in order to get you thinking about this, I'm going to bring in our global audience because I knew I wanted to talk about this. So we put up something on Instagram real quick and you guys respond like, oh my gosh, moths to a flame. It's incredible. I love you. And I asked, what would your life be like if you didn't worry about anything? And what are you worrying about right now? And so let me tell you some of the arrows that life is throwing at people. Um, I'm scared of flying. This is Sylvia. And um, I always worry because I feel out of control that I'm going to die on the plane flight. And here's the second arrow. You ready? That she's firing. What if I can't say goodbye? What if this is it? That's the second arrow. It's fine to be afraid of flying, but why are you torturing yourself with all these horrible thoughts? Instead, I want you to reach up and grab that second arrow that you're aiming at yourself with your worries in midair. I want you to yank it out of the air by going, what if it all works out? What if this plane lands? What if I not only get to see all these people that I love and say goodbye, but I'm the last one standing in my family. I outlive them all. What if it all works out? Here's another one. Maggie, annual reviews are coming up. Mm -hmm. Boom, that's an arrow in the heart. That's the first arrow. It is nerve-wracking. That's true. But why does Maggie need to go, what if I get fired? What if I'm the one that gets laid off? What's going to happen to my kids? How am I going to pay for groceries? That is the second arrow. That's why you need, what if it all works out? You reach up, you grab it. You grab it, you grab it, you grab it. Here's another one. Here's a really, really important one from Gabby. I'm going through a divorce. Boom, arrow straight to the heart. Even when you know it's the best thing, it's still painful, isn't it? That's what happens in your life. But the second arrow, what if I never, ever have the life that I actually want? You got to stop that shit from hitting your head. You got to stop firing that stuff right at yourself. That's why you got to reach up with these six words. What if it all works out? What if it all works out? What if getting divorced is painful, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me? What if this divorce is really challenging right now, but I'm going to emerge stronger and a better version of myself and my kids are going to be better and that's going to open the door to me being in a healthier, more supportive relationship? What if this is the best thing that ever happened to me, even though it's the hardest thing that ever happened to me? Isn't that awesome? This is how you stop firing that second arrow at yourself. Here's another one. There are natural disasters in the news all the time in the area that I live in. That's an arrow every time you see a natural disaster. But why do you have to fire the second one at yourself? What if the mudslide takes out my house? What if the volcano erupts here? What if the floods come and they wipe out that thing? It hasn't happened yet. So why on earth are you causing yourself this pain? I'll tell you why. Because we're used to doing it. This is what we do reflexively. Life fires an arrow and then we fire the second one. And so this is why what if it all works out isn't just putting lipstick on a pig or icing a shitty situation over with some like positive gloss. This is actually using science to combat your shitty habits of torturing yourself. This is you intervening with logic because if something bad hasn't happened, how does worrying about it help you right now? If you don't know what's actually going to happen, how does worrying about it or assuming the worst case going to make things better? It's not. In fact, you experience the pain twice because you experience the anticipation of it. And let's just say you are going to get fired. And look, I've been fired twice. I have been literally brought into somebody's office and told I'm doing a terrible job and let go. It is the worst. And then the second you leave, once you get over the humiliation of the whole thing, it's the most liberating thing that ever happens to you because you typically only get fired from a job that you can't stand anyway or that you know that you're not performing in, which is the case. But I knew it was coming. I just could feel it. I tortured myself for a month. I didn't need to do that because it didn't change the outcome. If anything, it made me experience it over and over and over. And I'll tell you, anticipating it, way worse than what actually happened. If I had just said to myself for those 30 days, what if it all works out, Mel? What if you do get fired and it's the best thing that ever happened? 
What if uh, you're not going to get fired, but this is a wake-up call for you to step it up and actually start performing a little bit better? It allows you to stop experiencing so much pain. Actually, yesterday, I, I, I did this before I flew to Salt Lake because I was racing around the house. I couldn't find my freaking computer charger. I couldn't find my passport. I couldn't find the bag that I normally put my travel equipment in. And I was racing around. I was freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, I, I only have 15 minutes before I got to go. What if I don't find the And I was like, Mel, stop. What if it all works out? What if you suddenly find the charger? Or better yet, you're an adult. You can get to an airport and buy a charger. So instead of literally firing arrows at yourself, you could stop firing it and focus. And that's why this is super, super important. I'm going to talk about the other reason why it's critical that you not escalate situations with this unnecessary worrying. Okay. Here, let me give you some other ones from our audience. Um, oh, Natalie. Anytime I see somebody else happy, Boom, arrow to the heart. That's what's happening around you. Then she fires a second one. What if I'm never going to find my person? Does worrying about that help you find your person? No. It actually makes you feel more insecure. And this is where I want to go next because here's the thing. There is a profound connection between catastrophizing and aiming these arrows at yourself and the pain that you feel and how it impacts your ability to problem solve to think clearly. This all comes from research out of UCLA from Dr. Judith Willis. I wrote about this extensively for my research in the High Five Habit book. We interviewed Dr. Judith Willis for that book and dug into her research. And she is pioneering all of this research around the connection between your nervous system and the ability for you to do what's called executive function. Executive function is basically the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex part of your brain, your forehead, basically, for those of us uh, kind of everyday people. It's your ability to problem solve. It's your ability to make strategic decisions. It's your ability to think clearly. When you start aiming that second arrow, my daughters must have fallen off a cliff. I haven't heard from her. Something terrible has happened. I'm going to get fired. I'm never going to be happy again. I'm never going to get this weight off. And the pain and the pain and the pain that comes with doing that to yourself it sets off the alarm, the fight or flight or freeze part of your nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, it's called. And when the alarm nervous system is going off, it impairs the cognitive functioning in your brain. It impacts decision making. It impacts your ability to focus. It impacts your ability to problem solve. And so you're not only firing a second arrow at yourself, which causes so much pain, you are also firing that arrow right into the center of your forehead. And it impacts your ability to think clearly, to solve a problem. And here's why this is important. Let's just say for those of you that are really skeptical and you're like, but yeah, but, but, but Mel, what if something bad does happen? What if, what if your daughter did fall off of a cliff and she's laying there with a broken clavicle and, and she needs help? I'll tell you what. If I don't hear from her in 72 hours, I need to move into problem solving mode, right? Is it going to help me? solve a problem halfway around the world if I've shot an arrow into the center of my forehead and I've worked myself into such a state that I can't think clearly? Uh, no. And so even if the worst case scenario that you're terrified about happens, your ability to face it, to problem solve through it, to think clearly about your options, it is severely impaired by this constant worrying that you are doing. And that's why this is so important. What if it all works out? It doesn't guarantee that it will. It guarantees that you will stay calm, that you will stay focused, that you will stay present, and that you will stay positive until you know otherwise. And that's everything. All right, I'm going to hit the pause real quick. I got to run to the bathroom because I have a feeling that I'm going to be talking to you right up until the time I got to race out of this hotel room to go give a speech. Don't go anywhere. I got more that I want to share with you, including a lot of really cool research. Stay with me. Welcome back. It's your pal Mel. And we're talking about the six words that I use that magically just boom, silences the worry spiral and my anxiety. What if it all works out? Okay. And another thing I'm going to confess to you is that until I stumbled on this, what if it all works out? I didn't realize how much I was doing this to myself. 
I basically walked around life with a second arrow in my head because I was constantly worried about something, constantly thinking something bad was going to happen. And, you know, some of the experts that we've had on this podcast that talk about trauma or talk about the impact of growing up in a chaotic household or experiencing abuse or being the kind of person that felt like as a kid, you were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. You were super hyper vigilant. This is very, very common for people like us. That is me. Miss looking around the corners, what, 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 what is the bad thing that's going to happen, anticipating things. And what I'm here to tell you is that if you start to really lean into what I'm talking about, which is how you aim the second arrow at your forehead and you start utilizing, well, what if it all works out to grab the second arrow, yank it out of your forehead and be present in the moment and not escalate things until necessary, you can still tap into your intuition. You can still look around corners which is a superpower for you. But you don't have to add on the pain that all of the negative thoughts are creating. And there's so much research about this. First of all, stress can actually lead to physical pain. It comes from Dr. Arthur Barsky, who's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, where they've done these studies uh, about how stress can lead to physical pain. And let me tell you something. When you start allowing yourself to worry, I'm not going to get into college. Uh, I'm not going to be finding love uh, after my spouse has died, or I'm never going to get this weight off, or I'm not going to get control of this. When you start doing that to yourself, it does cause physical pain. And you know this. How many times have you been so stressed out or worried that you get a headache? Or you've been worried before a test and you get nauseous, don't you? Or you start shaking or your stomach is twisting in knots. That's why we say twisting in knots, because that's what it feels like. It's physical pain. And a lot of times it begins from your nervous system getting triggered. That's the first arrow. And the second arrow is your thoughts. So they've done all of this interesting research. And what they have been able to prove in studies is that the neural pathways in your brain that indicate physical pain, the same ones light up when you have a painful thought. And it is painful to think that you're never going to be happy. It is painful to think you're not going to see your loved ones again. It is painful to think that you're never going to achieve your dreams or that you're never going to amount to something. That's why I want you to stop it. Scientists have also done this really interesting study where they looked at math anxiety. So math anxiety is literally just feeling stressed out and worried when you're about to do math problems. And the anticipation of doing math prompts a similar brain reaction as when you experience pain. And the researcher, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the leading expert on math anxiety, said that it is the equivalent of burning one's hand on a hot stove. And I love knowing this research because it allows you to stop and go, huh, it is true. Because it is painful. It's painful to think these thoughts. And that's why I want you to really steal these six words for me. What if it all works out? I also want you to steal this Buddhist teaching and proverb that when misfortune or stress or something doesn't meet your expectations or something painful happens in your life, that is the first arrow. Hits you right in the heart. But the second arrow is the one that you fire back at yourself into the center of your forehead based on what you think about what just happened. And that's the piece that you have control over. Yes, you will always think negative thoughts, but you don't have to escalate it. You don't have to stay there. And you can use these six words, what if it all works out, and logic to pause that spiral and to question your thinking. And when you question yourself, well, what if it all works out? The fact is, it just might, right? Like, you don't know. You haven't even entertained that possibility because you've been so busy firing arrows at your forehead, you didn't even stop to think, well, there's a whole different possibility here. And based on the research of Penn State, 91% of the time, that's the possibility. So what the hell am I all worked up about? Because getting worked up, as we know, based on the research at UCLA and from Dr. Judith Willis, it doesn't help me. And... Here's the final piece. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to face the things that are painful in your life. 
And I also believe in your ability to problem solve and to rise to these moments where life is painful and life is challenging. And if something bad is going to happen, I want you to not face it with an arrow in your head. I want you to have your full capacity to think clearly, to ask for help, to solve whatever issue is happening in your life. And that's why this is also important. It's because between now and whenever something amazing or something terrible happens in your life, you have the ability to be more present and to assume good intent and assume a positive outcome. And that is going to help you both enjoy your life, but it's also going to help you face things if they do in fact turn out to be hard, which we know based on the research is about 6% of the time. Those are odds I'm willing to play with. I'm willing to play with those odds. I'm willing to bet that things are okay. I'm willing to bet on you and me and our ability to be more positive, to be more optimistic, to be more trusting, and to live in that space until we know otherwise. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? I think it does too. When you train yourself to reach up and grab that second arrow before it hits your forehead, because you don't know. You don't know. So you might as well coach yourself to think something positive will happen. You might as well learn how to default to positive ideation, where you say, this could be the best thing that ever happens to me. This isn't easy, but I trust that I'm going to grow through it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I can figure it out. This is more difficult than I thought it would be, but boy, am I proud of myself for doing this. When you can default to positive ideation, I haven't heard from her in two days. She must be having the time of her life. I haven't heard from her in two days, but I saw that sunrise, which means she's probably so busy with all the friends she made up there because she was also taking photos of other people up there. Uh, she must be so busy. She didn't have time to talk to her mother. And wouldn't that be the most amazing thing that could happen if you went on a four-month solo backpacking trip as a 24-year-old woman to be so caught up in the moment that you don't have time to check in at home? Boy, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And that's what I am telling myself because that's what I believe is true. And research shows that getting your mind to focus on positive thoughts, positive outcomes, visualizing, hey, what would it look like if this all works out? Scientists call this positive ideation. It is so effective in beating down that worry. So I want you to try it. Because, hey, what if you use these six words and it all works out? That would be a beautiful thing. And I find this to be really interesting. See, mantras cut both ways because there are good mantras and bad mantras. There are mantras that work and mantras that don't. Mantras are powerful, but they don't work unless you believe what the mantra or the phrase says. And I'm going to unpack this because I think this is super important. It's why so many of us get positive self-talk or self-love completely wrong. A mantra is only going to work if you believe intrinsically in what the mantra means. And so I'll give you an example. A lot of you have been told that you need to uh, have more positive self-talk, which you do. But if you've been beating yourself up for 40 years, there is no way you can stand in front of a mirror and say, I love myself. Or if you've been just hating on your body for decades, you're not going to be able to stand in front of the mirror and go, I look beautiful. I want you to feel those things. But if your behavior and your own mindset proves day in and day out that you don't love yourself, that you not only don't think your body is beautiful, you think it's disgusting, or you think it's gross, or you think it's this, or you think it's that. Simply saying a mantra because you think you should, it will not work. It actually makes things worse because your mind is like, oh, what do you mean you, you, you think you're, no, you don't. You know what you said to yourself all day yesterday? No, it's not true. And your mind starts to fight against it. And so it makes your negative beliefs worse. And so one of the things that 
I want you to think about is that as you come up with this phrase for yourself, rule number one, it has to be meaningful. And what I mean by that is a meaningful mantra is one that you can get behind. It's one that when you say it or somebody else says it to you, you're like, yeah, I can get behind that. So for example, if you struggle with how you look, instead of saying, I'm beautiful, when you don't quite feel it and believe it yet, start saying, I deserve kindness. I'm trying my best. I deserve to feel better. My body needs me to take care of it. Those are all things that you can get behind. And so oftentimes, one of the things that I say, if you're just kind of new to thinking about some guiding phrase or a meaningful mantra or some sort of word that you're going to use as your theme or your lifeline, is like, bring it down just a little. Like, don't jack the mantra up like, I am the best. Because some days you're not going to feel that way. And so if you have that tattooed on your wrist, you're going to be like, I don't feel like the best right now. You want to ratchet it down just a little so you can always get behind it. I'm trying my best. Anybody can get behind that. Here's some other ones. What if it works out? I've talked a lot about that on the podcast. I love that one. What if it works out? So many people don't even realize that their guiding philosophy right now is, what if it doesn't work out? Imagine adopting the meaningful mantra. What if it works out? Another one that I love is courage. Courage. You know, I think courage comes first. We often sit around and feel self-doubt or feel unmotivated. In those moments, courage, that courage inside you to act, to say something, to show up when you don't feel like it. Courage is what you need first. And so courage is a beautiful reminder. You got this. You got this as just encouragement. I believe in you. I love that phrase. I believe in you. One day at a time. That's sort of like one gate, isn't it, hon? Yeah, it is a little bit like that. But I think what you're speaking to also is that um, like everything that you just mentioned almost alludes to a way of being or an attitude or, you know, a certainly a reminder. I'm glad that our kids haven't decided yet on what or when to put ink on their body, but mm -hmm. I like the fact that they're they're clearly reticent until they find that thing. And that mm. thing is by way of having watched us find our own phrase, yeah, which is very meaningful and has a profound message to us and it is sort of embodied in uh, a philosophy for lack of a better term that they haven't found that yet mm. and some of that could just be that they haven't grown up enough yet if you will to have put their finger on well what do I really need in those times uh, to be reminded or to be encouraged or, and I, I, at least I think that's the hiccup so far for our kids that, mm. that they just haven't, they haven't arrived on that yet. Well, I will tell you what I do want everyone to do. I do want you to take us passing you the mic very seriously. And I want you to try the power of creating a meaningful mantra or a word or a phrase that you can turn to every day. And I do want you to get a post-it note or a piece of painter's tape or something that you can write your phrase, word, or mantra that's meaningful to you on it. And let's take it a step further. I'd love to see these. And I believe in you is a good one. I believe in you. I believe in you. For years though, that probably, well, if I think about it from me in the present moment, it wouldn't sink because there have been plenty of moments where I didn't believe in myself. Mm -hmm. But if I think about it as a message from the future Mel, the person I'm becoming, as if she 
was saying to me, I believe in you, Mel, and I know what's coming, and that's why I believe in you. That would go, ooh, I love that. That's really, maybe that'll be my next tattoo. But it's interesting how you describe that as though it's something outside of you or a voice or something mm -hmm. external. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think of one gate as, like I don't hear my dad talking to me per se. Like I don't see my dad all the time. I think of it, whereas what you were just describing is, some larger voice, which is profound and and can be powerful, but it's uh, it conjures up a visual. It shall be as a larger voice for me. Yeah, it is. And so I would love to see your meaningful mantra, and I'd love to see you. So take a photo of you and your post-it note, or you and your sharpie, and share your phrase or word or mantra. And tag me, Mel Robbins. Tag the podcast, the Mel Robbins podcast. You might even be featured on our social media channels. But mostly, I just want to see you and give you a virtual hug and a high five. And um, I want to get inspired by you. Speaking of meaningful mantras that you say to yourself, there's something I want to be sure to say to you. In case nobody else tells you this today, I wanted to tell you that I love you. I love you too. And I believe in you. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to create a life that you love, one gate at a time. And if you do, it shall be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's go get tattoos. <laughs> Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.